Well, listen, so uh, we're here tonight uh, in our studio, CTF TV studios, and we're here with uh, New Life Drama Company. And uh, we're going to have a really, really awesome time tonight, folks. We really, really uh, want you just to sit back, enjoy the night. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about some of the stuff that's going on in the youth today. Uh, and also some testimonies that they're going to be sharing. There's going to be some um, skits that they're going to do. And uh, we got a surprise at the very end uh, because you'll have an opportunity to, uh, if you don't know Jesus, is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, uh, so before we get started, uh, Melvin, since you're going to be, oh, actually, I should go over here. She's got the black yes, shirt. Sir, that's she, true. She's a supervisor, true. right? <laughs> but Melvin, yes, go ahead and share with you and introduce everybody, yes, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. Well, my name is Melvin Fisher. Um, I was, I'm 19 years old. I'm born. I'm from Pennsylvania State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're part of New Life Drama Company. We're a young adults traveling drama ministry. We go all across the United States delivering the gospel through drama. And uh, the ministry has been around since 1983. Mm -hmm. We go to about 400 plus churches a year. There's another team right now in, uh, I believe, the South Dakota. And um, so we travel all across the United States delivering the gospel through drama, like I said. Um, we minister to churches, serve in any way we can. Um, the, the ministry are, is between the ages of 18 and 25. And um, I think we'll just go around and introduce where we're from and our names, starting over here. Um, I'm Samantha Turnage, and I'm from Fitzgerald, Georgia. I'm Rachel Matthews, and I'm from Waco, Texas. My name is Becca. I'm from Orlando, Florida. And I'm Melvin, State College, Pennsylvania. My name's Sam, and I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm Pastor Eric. I'm your host for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and we got to get, we got, Becca is on fire tonight, so we got to slow her down. Man, she's like, yeah, you ought to be sitting over here, like sitting, sitting over here. On the <laughs> I get way too excited, way too fast. I know, I know, I know. So, you, uh, where, where is your home base at? Where, where do you? Uh... We're from Scottsdale, Arizona. That's our ministries from there. Uh, we're based out of a church called Oasis Community Church. Okay, okay. And the, the the New Life Drama Company, we're a company, but we're kind of blanketed by the church. Um, it originally started back in 1983 out of Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm. About five and a half years ago, they moved it in from into Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay. So, and then we go out to three. We do three month tours at a time. We're traveling 365 days out of the year. Get 10 days off for Christmas to go back home with our family, and then we come back on. And uh, every three months, we go back to home base, split up the teams, get new people, and some people leave for further ministry. Mm. And uh, we just mix up the jobs, and you go back on the road for another three months. So. We have four tours of what we call it, a winter tour, a spring tour, and a summer tour, and a fall tour. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the usual uh, time frame that you, you're you on the team for, you know, like, is there, is, what's, the, what's the longest time that anybody's been on the team? Is there is there a time sure. or is there About a... three years is, a, is, a, um, is kind of the vision that they have for you. Yeah. Now, uh, some people stay longer, like Becca's been in here for five years. Yeah. Five years. Too long. She's the senior, <laughs> she, she, the senior representative, she's right? A, yes, yeah. She's a veteran, veteran on the field. Yeah. Um, but usually it's a, it's a ministry that uh, you come in and you get your feet wet. Um, it's something you do. It's, it's a great thing to do if you don't, you're don't you not sure what you're going to do right out of high school or college or if you're not even sure. Where, if you know you're called to uh, ministry full-time, but you're not sure where to. Okay. Um, you know, you get a lot of opportunities. We meet a lot of pastors, a lot of uh, different things, cool things like this, you know, that people at our age don't every day, you know. Um, and so it's a, it's a great way to get your feet wet in ministry and see God. We see a lot of people get called out of the ministry into uh, pastorship, um, missionaries, evangelists, all kinds of ministries. And mm -hmm. Most of the people that travel through here end up doing some kind of ministry after this. Right. Well, I think one of the questions, uh, we're a non-denominational church. Yeah. Uh, which so we, we, we have a lot more freedom, so to speak. Yes, sir. Um, so you, you do go to various different denominational churches. What's, what's your, what's your um, um, input on that? Do you, do you see a large variety of uh, reactions, so to speak, to what you guys do? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. We are, well, we say we're interdenominational, so we, I mean, we go to all different kinds of denominations. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything from Baptist, Methodist, uh, non-denominational, obviously, um, pretty much everything in between. So 
I mean, we go to we go to about everything. So we get a, I mean, again, like you said, we get the opportunity that we have is to literally get to go to talk to pastors and stuff like that, um, and just to hear all different kinds of uh, forms of theology uh, takes on the scriptures and stuff. So we go we go anywhere and everywhere if the Lord opens the door. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, since Becca, since you've been here for five, since you've been here for five years, what is the uh, I'm going to say the most um, struggling one that you've ever uh, I'm not going to say a denominational church or anything like that, but what was the um, attitude of the church and what was your, you know, I know you're just bubbling to tell a story. <laughs> it's true. I love telling stories. Um, I mean, it's hard to pick one because there's a lot of different kinds of not okay things, I guess. I don't really know what word to put to it. Um, I think one of the hardest types of churches to deal with are the ones that have no idea what they're doing. Like they just kind of have us and they have no plan whatsoever. And I don't mean that in the sense that they're like, yeah, go ahead, do whatever you want. Cause we can handle that. We're adults. I think it's more like, okay, we're going to meet in the morning and then we're going to do something. And it's like, oh, okay. I don't know what time morning is, but I guess we'll figure that out. So we get up. There was one specific church I think of that uh, we got up at 8 a.m to get ready for the day because he said mid-morning. So we're thinking, okay, he'll get here around like 9, 10 o'clock maybe, maybe, 11 by the latest. He showed up at 2 p.m. So we haven't eaten because he hasn't brought us food. He shows up at 2 p.m. and he's like, all right, uh, here's your food and it's just a couple of donuts. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> and um, he didn't have a plan. He was like, that's it. We just have some food for you. Um, I thought we were going to do some cleaning, but I, nah, I don't. I changed my mind. Uh, do you guys need showers? How about you guys come to my mo my uh, house tomorrow morning? You come around 8 o'clock-ish for showers. And so we showed up at his house the next morning at 8 o'clock. And he wasn't expecting us. Yeah. He was like, what, what are you doing here? I, I mean, I know you needed showers, but I, I didn't think you were guys who were going to come until like 11, maybe 12. I'm like, maybe we should have expected that, sir. Uh -huh. Let me ask you a question because I know in my in my own um, I've been in ministry for 27 years and uh, with two churches and travel all over the world. Uh, one of the things that seems is one of my pet peeves hmm. is tardiness. <laughs> so I, I can relate to that story, but does that does that seem to be a a prevalent thing throughout a lot of the churches? Roughly. Um, I wouldn't say all the churches, to be honest. I think it's like a 60 40, um, 40 percent being the ones that are on time. <laughs> okay. um, I don't know why that's one of the issues that I find within the church. I think it's just because we're so like okay with not being there. Like, you know what? If I end up at a gas station and praying with somebody, that's cool. But I also I think there's a certain level of respect that we need to have for each other. Um, so I don't know why that's a yeah. why that's an it's issue. All, it's all that Pentecostal time. <laughs> it's all time. Right. Oh, it's, it's just PT time. Said, well, I, I hate to tell you, but I'm going to script and tell you that's sin. Yeah, that's true. You're stealing time. <laughs> <laughs> so the quiet ones over here, tell me a story. Okay. Um, so actually, just recently, we were at a stop and. I think I was just chilling with God, and we've seen a lot of really cool miracles happen recently. Wow. And at least, like, I've been able to witness, like, team members, like, pray over people, and through God, the person that they prayed over got healing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. You know, I, I want to be able to do that. But, like, some part of me, I just didn't believe that I could. Like, I was like, why would God use me? But that's silly because, like, why would God use any of us? Right. It's for the glory of him. It's not for anything that we've done. And I don't know why, but it took, like, a certain sermon that I was listening to to, like, it click. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, next time I get a chance, like, like God, bring someone to me that I, that I can pray over. Mm -hmm. And the next day we had a Sunday morning service, and the pastor's daughter came to me. And, um. She wanted prayer for her ribs, the side. It had been hurting all night long. Mm -hmm. And I had noticed that morning that, like, she was in pain. And so I prayed over it, and I thanked God, you know, while I was praying. And it wasn't in pain afterwards. And that was Amen. so cool to me. So <laughs> that's something that recently happened that, like, blew my mind. Amen. Amen. I mean, I've seen a lot of different things happen. But there was this one story about this girl um, she was dealing with a lot of um, unforgiveness in her life, and we were like, we had done a service at the church and all this other cool stuff, and like she 
came up and we do like altar calls after we do services. So she came up to me and she approached me and she said that her, um, her family had like hurt her in a lot of different ways and that she wanted forgiveness. Um, she wanted to, um, forgive them, but she also like wanted to accept the Lord into her heart too at the same night. And I was like, Whoa, Lord, this is crazy. And it's just like, Cause, um, like Rachel was saying, like, why would he use any of us? And like, cause I had the same perspective for a long time. Like, why would he use any of us? Cause it's just like, we are here and we were put on this earth to serve him. Yes. So Amen. that was really cool to me. Amen. Awesome. Well, one of the things that, um, new life, uh, drama company does is skits. So, uh, I requested to do, uh, one of the ones that you know, we've, we've had them out at, our, at both of our churches in Pensrue and Salem. Uh, and um, it, they, they, they do, I love their humor. Uh, it's almost like uh, British humor. You, <laughs> and what I mean by British humor is you really have to watch it to really understand it. So uh, a lot of people, I remember when last time the guys were over in Pensrue and there was a couple of people saying, I didn't get some of those skits. I said, because you weren't watching. You have to watch and listen. You know, it's like English humor, you know. And uh, so at this time, we're going to have a team come out, and they're going to do a, a brief skit for you. Uh, I'll just describe it really quick. The skit we're going to do is called Ways Not to Use Your Bible. Uh, and it's just short, funny. We like to use it as an opener. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. So, again, the skit is called Ways Not to Use Your Bible. One, two. One, two, three, four. Ways not to use your Bible. Your Bible is not a coaster. <sighs> this is some good old sweet tea, but the glass is so sweaty and I have nowhere to put it. Oh, look, a coffee table. Wait. You can't set it there. Well, why not? You need a coaster. Well, that's true, but I don't have a coaster. Hmm. Oh, here, use my Bible. Thanks! <laughs> yes, your Bible is an amazing spiritual weapon, but not so much a physical one. Hey, Samantha. Hey, Rebecca. So I, like, heard from a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend that you want to get saved. Yeah! Are you saved yet? No, but my arm really hurts. Oh. Um, well, there's healing in the Word. Are you saved now? No, I just don't get it. Oh. Ladies, don't use your Bible to pick up dudes. Time to go to the gym. One, two, okay. hundred. <laughs> hey, good looking what you got cooking. Oh, you know, nothing much. Just the old hammies. <laughs> One, two. Okay, that's enough with the hammies. Um, so I was reading in the book of numbers and I realized I don't have yours. I don't even have a cell phone, you silly goose. Um, your muscles are as big as the boulder in front of Jesus's tomb. Come again? I said your muscles are as big as the boulder in front of Jesus's tomb. Muscles? Yeah. Like this one. Yeah. How about that one? Yes. The one right here. Yeah. The one right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> muscles, muscles, muscles. You know what? That's all you girls ever care about. Us guys, we have feelings too, you know. I cried when I watched Moana. You don't even deserve this. <laughs> well, it worked for Solomon. Yes, your Bible has a lot of books of prophecy in it, but it's not a fortune teller. Hey, Sam. What's up, man? How you doing today? Oh, pretty good. Just got hit on by a weird girl at the gym earlier. Uh, but, other than that, nothing much. <laughs> really? Well, my day wasn't that exciting. Yeah. What but, are we doing tonight? And you know, I really don't have anything planned. Um, hey, you don't have this Bible right here. Let's ask oh, it. All right, let's all right, ask it. Bible, 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 right. Tell us what to do tonight. Huh? <clears throat> man, what did you uh, what did you put in my tea oh, earlier? Let's, let's, let's read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and Judas went and hung himself. All right. Oh, okay, that's not a good deal. I'll just go find a tree. Wait, wait, no, 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 I can't do that. No, you take, no, you take the Bible. Seriously, you, you take the Bible. The Bible. No, it's your Bible. It's your Bible. Wait, wait, no, wait, 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 we, we forgot something. We, for, we, forgot to, we forgot to shake it. Oh, we, we always forget. We always forget the shaky part. Okay. Shake, 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 shake it. Okay, now you read it this time. 
and you should go and do likewise. Oh, oh okay. I'll just go find a tree in a row. But wait, no, wait, no, 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 You've just seen ways not to use your Bible. Your Bible is not a coaster. A weapon. A way to pick up on the dudes. A fortune teller. To use your Bible correctly, simply open it, read it, study it, apply it. It's that easy. Just uh, this morning, right? Yes, sir. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> no, because I've seen it before. <laughs> uh, awesome, awesome. You you guys really enjoy it. That that's well drama company, you know. Yes. Um, you guys like acting. Is that yeah. is that something that um, uh, when when you joined the team, uh, did you have a passion deep down inside somehow because? What, what, let, me, let me put it this way. Do you see sometimes uh, young adults coming and they really don't know what to expect oh, and yeah. all of a sudden they go, this isn't for me? Definitely. You know? Uh, with some, you know. For me personally, um, I did not want to do anything with acting. Uh, and the reason I joined was because the Lord told me to join. And uh, I grew up on a dairy farm until I was 15 years old. <laughs> and so. You know, I love sports and anything like that, fishing, hunting, and when I ever, and I never really, you know, when I thought of acting or drama or movies, I, that's for the wimps, or and that's, that's not for yeah. real men, and so, uh, <coughs> so when New Life, <laughs> but when the drama team came to my church, my youth group, uh, two years ago, they, uh, they told me to join, you know, hey, you should join before the service, and I was like, I just laughed at them, I said, of course not, of course not, I mean, I, mean, I got my life figured out, and I want to do construction. And uh, they said, well, pray about it at least one time during the service. And so I did. And one thing, that, the main thing that attracted me was the freedom and the joy they had. I was, I want that. Mm -hmm. Because in my life at that time, I may have been free for a month and just living in Christ and the identity that Christ has, my new identity. But I was still struggling with things. Mm -hmm. And I was, how do I finally be free from the things that the world says I can't be free from? And the joy and the unity and just the spirit of God on them and anointing. So, um, so after the service, I prayed about it, and the Lord said, just go for it. And I said, you can just leave everything behind. He said, yep, yes. just go for it. Trust me. <laughs> so after the service, I went to him and said, you know, what does it take to join? They said, well, you got to go online and sign up. And I said, well, I don't have a computer. And they're like, well, we can sign you up right here. <laughs> so, uh, got him. They, <laughs> they did. So they took me, and they signed me up right there. And um, yeah. before they signed me up or during the sign-up process, I'm not sure which one it was, uh, the one girl, she's a, she's a wife of the director now, um, she said, I asked her, you know, I don't really know how to act and stuff. And she's like, oh, you're fine, you're fine. I said, I I'll work and I'll pray for people. Well, I'd love to do that. But the acting, I'm not sure if I can figure that out. She said, ah, you can just come and you can work and pray. And uh, they got me in three months of training and you, you learn, they teach you how to act. Yeah. Got phenomenal teachers. So. Amen. Amen. Yeah. But Amen. I, I think there's a, I don't know if he, he grew up, some of us, it's kind of, we get a mixture. Some people come in, some people just come in for the acting, and they're surprised that there's a lot of servanthood that goes with it, a lot of dying to sell. Um, yeah. Other people come in uh, not to act, just to, yeah. you know, I came in for the environment, I believe, and um, I didn't realize how much I learned through it. And, uh, very grateful, very grateful. Well, that's one of the things, um, you know, uh, Mary Halter, who's on part of your team, um, uh, mother and father go to our church, and, and, um, I've seen, uh, not just in her, but in other, other of the parts of your team that we've had before, just talking with them and just looking and seeing how God is just moving. You know, one of the things we're going to talk just in a little bit is about what's happening with our youth today. Um, and, you, you know, it's like I could sit here and just cry out and hungry for the youth to just get on fire for the Lord, um, you know, like I said I've been I've been full time ministry for 27 years. I'll be 63 next week, so we're we're in the same we're in the same, huh? That's why I sat you next to me. Um, I'll be 63, 
And it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things is when I first got into ministry, it was like, man, I was so on fire for the Lord, you know, do anything. Not that I have retired and I'm not retiring. That's one, one thing, just to let you know, okay, yes, when you become a full-time minister, there's no retirement plan. Yes, the retirement plan is when you get to heaven. Right. Amen? Right. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> But, but one of the things I, I have seen is it just, it just, my heart just is blessed every time I see you guys come in. Uh, even other, other, you know, um, we had uh, in Pensgrove area, the Catholic Church uh, sponsored, uh, there was, um, was it, 100 and, 100 and some youth came in. They built four homes. Scratch. Uh, it, it was. It was like every night they had. They they sat around and they 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 sang. They had worship. They had time together. And I was just so. I mean, I didn't get a chance. I didn't even know what was going on. Sure. But you know, just to see that environment is such a is such a major blessing. You know, what is the atmosphere that you see in the churches today with the youth? I think a lot of. I think a lot of people, um, I think one thing is, and, and one thing like the Lord's laid on my heart is that you know, Scripture talks about the young taking wisdom and, and gleaning from the old or from the, the older folks around us and the next generation. And I think one thing that uh, my generation is filled to do is to do that. And we push them away. But also, the older generation um, has, they've seen how they've been res responded to. And they shut the door, and uh, God doesn't ask us to shut the door, right. um, even if it, it takes 10, 20 times. Um, so I think there's a miscommunication between the two generations, and the younger generation needs the older generation, even when they don't know it. Right. And the older generation sometimes doesn't realize that, and they just walk away. Right. Um, but in the younger generation, a lot of the atmosphere, I think, is um, there's definitely a lot of depression, a lot of depression. Now, why, why do you think that there is uh, that state? Because um, I know an area, I'm sure probably wherever you guys go, we have, a, especially in Salem County, even South Jersey area, we are inundated with the opiate issues and, and stuff like that. We have people dying left and right every day. I mean, overdosing, overdosing, overdosing. And, you know, I, I look at these things and I see them and it's like uh, we just had, we were just talking earlier we had a baptism at our church on um, on Sunday. Uh, a young fellow who has been sober, clean, and so forth and so on. Uh, I mean, it was like he had he has a smile on his face wow. that is permanent. Wow. That's how much of a glow he has. Wow. Um, but about four months ago, we had another baptism, and guy came up, and he was, you know, a little bit older and stuff like that, and loves the Lord. And uh, we just buried him two months ago. He went back to his old his old state, and um, you know what what's the what's the what do you what do you see what do you see like you know and I'm not getting into personal things when people come up to pray and stuff like that, but uh, is is that atmosphere there? Are they are are the young people actually crying out for to be think, to be helped? I think you know? personally, they're probably all. Testaments. I know one cool thing is um, God uses each one of us in kind of different ways, and it'll be interesting. We'll pray for people, and I know in my life and a lot of people that I've prayed over, there's a lot of young men that um, either their fathers aren't there, or their fathers have walked away, yeah. um, and they're they're just they need purpose, they need a desire to live, and they don't know why to live, and so there's no zeal, there's no, no purpose, um, and one thing you know doesn't take the right words and um, it takes the Holy Spirit and the yeah. mark of God yeah. to move in them and I've been able to see a lot of that a lot of them um, a lot of a lot of actually I just had a really cool testimony we were at a, a New Wilmington conference a mission conference and there was a young man there 17 years old no 15 years old he looked 17 I just want to move this around there you go alright uh, he was 15 years old and he was uh, he was kind of the cool kid in the crowd you could tell and, um, but I could tell, like, the Lord just started speaking a lot of things to me about him, um, 
God kind of said, I'm going to speak to him by the end of the week. And so, anyway, one of the nights we did a service, and, and I got to share my testimony and just the drugs and the alcohol that I was involved in and what the Lord has done in my life and freed me from. Um, and he came to me, and he shared his testimony and his life. Um, his dad uh, left him when he was uh, eight months old, and his mom um, married and or was dating another guy, is dating another guy, and that guy doesn't accept him, and then... Um, his mom split off, no, the younger, one of his sisters was adopted, or gave away for adoption, something like that, but anyway, a lot of the, he takes a lot of the blame on himself, and the parents will blame him, um, so just very broken kid, and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's really, I think, it, I think one thing in our generation is, uh, they're looking for something, and um, they try to find it in drugs, alcohol, other things, and, you know, they find out it's empty, and that's really where he was, he was empty, he didn't understand, and he wanted to he wanted to find it in Christ. Um, and so we prayed over him, and the Lord just uh, wrecked him. The Lord mm -hmm. just moved mightily in his heart. And uh, his eyes his eyes were brighter, and he just got that glow, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been responding with him a little bit uh, a few weeks, or last week I did. And so he's been doing a lot better. But I think uh, there's a shift that happens. And I know in my own life, um, I was looking for something. Religion wasn't working. And drugs, the alcohol, everything leaves empty. Um, but I think we have to be willing to, we have to be ready to step in. And um, it's very important that we walk close with God so that when we hear him speak, mm -hmm. that we're able to be the person, be Jesus to them in, mm -hmm. in a time of emptiness. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean, I'll, I'll say to that, you know, there, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of young men, any young woman out there that um, they don't seem to have, kind of like Mel was talking about that, that, that purpose in their life. They, they really just need someone to go in there and say, hey, you know, not only does Jesus love you, but he wants you to really live for him, to really wants you to seek him. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'll say to that it is on the, on, the, on the bright side of that, too, is that I think um, that our generation is a generation that isn't going to accept mediocre Christianity. They're not going to they're not going to accept something that's that's fake for sure. Right. Uh, they want they want something genuine. They want something real. And so I, I think that's for me very hopeful um, because I know that the I believe that there's there's a really cool move of God that is already happening. Yeah. and It's going to continue to happen. Uh, but I think with that, it's, go it's going to be very real. It's going to be very genuine mm -hmm. um, because our generation is looking for something that is real. It's looking for, uh, we're all about authenticity. Yeah. And so uh, I think that as they continue to, um, really, I think if we have just a few honest leaders and people in our generation that just rise up to kind of take that lead, that stand and say, hey, this, is the, this is the real way to live. This is the way this Jesus is real. And they're looking for something tangible. And so I think with that, it's going to be a, a really, really neat uh, move of God that's coming. Amen. Uh, on that same note, you know, I think one of the things that I um, continue to see is, uh, as I was talking with Mary, we, we were on the phone for about, about 45 minutes, and I'm going to ask the girls. And, and the thing that was very interesting was, because uh, she was saying that even in the way that churches are receiving you guys now, there's a little bit changing here, and some stuff is going on, and there is. There's a shifting. There's a shifting that is going on right now. And, and I have to go with what Melvin had said earlier um, about, you know, the older generation and the younger generation. And I'm going to share this and I'll get right back to the question. We, had a, uh, we, had a, we have a panel, uh, which actually we do the show here. It's called The Culture. And it's a, a whole variety of different variety of young, old, whatever. And uh, there was a young pastor on, um, youth pastor, and... Very, I mean, when he first walked in, I went, who's this guy, you know? Yeah. Uh, he came in, but he was so profound. I mean, the things he said. And this was something that was very interesting because what happened was, the question was, um, a girl in my church, this is what the host was saying, a girl in our church uh, was a praise and worship leader. Beautiful voice, passion for, passion for the word, passion for singing. Gets up there, just an anointing on her, um, but she ended up getting pregnant out of wedlock. So the church set her down. And so the question was, what's the best thing to do? And I'm sitting in the back, and I'm sitting there as a pastor for 27 years and yeah. say, well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're somebody in authority, sure. you shouldn't, you know? And this is, a, a, so the young, the young youth guy, he said, one thing he says I have learned, and I mean, you know, young guy, 
was the one thing I'd learned. He says, the church is very good at disciplining. Wow. But terrible at reconciliation. Wow, that's good. And I went, I stopped and just went, wow. And that is true. And I'm saying that for the older set. What we want to do is, and I'm saying this as an example, what we want to do is we want to see when you guys do something wrong, we're going to discipline you. Sure. But we don't come alongside to reconcile and and be, and bring. We don't we don't do that. And I think that's one of the things that we have to learn as an older generation with the younger generation. You know, um, we see it so often that you know it's like, well, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? Why would you do this? Instead of coming alongside and literally putting our arms around and saying, you know. If you did this, this would have been, you know, and learn how to learn how to uh, reconcile. Um, what what do you girls see uh, specifically in the female side, okay, of uh, the church? Because there's, um, and I'm just going to put it right out there. You have, uh, I'm I'm talking. It's the guys against the girls. Um, you have you have the girls that uh, are out there that flaunt what they have, flaunt with everything, and then you have the guys over here, and you have, what, what is your, what is your, um, your sense on women, young ladies in the church, put it that way? Um, they are, I mean, I'm sure some of the issues are similar. Um, I, obviously, I don't pray for a whole lot of guys. I usually, it's the women that come to me. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed is that whether they're on the side of I go to church every day and I've been raised as a Christian, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or they're on the side of I grew up an atheist and I flaunt what I have, et cetera, et cetera, um, on either side, they just desire to have love um, because I think we've done a bad job on both sides of showing care and love to people um, just in general. I mean, I could even – my own testimony with my parents, like – um, I was raised in a Christian home. I knew the Lord. I've never doubted that he's real. Um, but I never knew what love meant. I didn't understand that he loved me because I never experienced it from my parents because they didn't know how to love me and they were too focused on their own issues. And I think all across the board, sorry if I get emotional, every young woman that comes up to me, or at least probably 98% of the young ladies that I pray for, um, they're depressed and suicidal or they're confused about their identity, and it's literally just because they're looking for love anywhere that they will be able to receive it. Right. Because for some reason, we have a lack of love flowing, whether in or out of the church. And I don't know where that disconnect is, other than, I mean, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and he's stealing our identities, he's killing our joy, and he's destroying our lives. Yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things that it's a detrimental problem with our internet, with Facebook, and all that stuff, it's, it's stealing our identity. You know, we, we end up we end up um, painting a picture, which we aren't really aren't, and you know, so people can yeah. see us in the in the realm that we would like to be, not in the eyes of Christ, but in the eyes of what we want people to see. You know, what I mean, what's some of the um, some of the things that you see with 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 uh, young girls? I know. Um, so we were at a, a camp a few weeks ago, and I think the main thing that I like saw in all the girls, which broke my heart, was uh, like unforgiveness, but also just with that unforgiveness with themselves. Mm -hmm. Like they held the, their standards for themselves super high because that's what they've been raised with. So there's just a lot of disappointment within themselves because, you know, they want to do better. You know, they blame themselves for the things that, you know, their parents' faults or someone else's faults. They blame themselves for a lot. And it just causes a lot of inner turmoil. So I know that, like, going to that camp, like, it broke my heart just seeing those girls in that state. But being able to, like, pray with them and just, just show them just constant love throughout that whole week was so nice, seeing the difference of, like, how they were after, like, that week. It was really nice to see. Yeah. Now, I know when you were good talking about love and even with the guys, because it's, it's sometimes it's hard for guys to show love um, because a lot of times the, 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 your father – you know, doesn't love us the way that, you know, well, you know, you shouldn't be crying, you know, uh, pull, pull your belt straps up, you're all right. <laughs> you know, that, you know, all that stuff like that, especially coming as an older person, you know, so forth and so on. But um, we're talking about it being the whole love factor 
but I also think that isn't it something else to do with with self confidence and being appreciated? You know, people. Um, I, I think one of the things ends up being is we don't appreciate people as much as we should. You know, in in what they do, and you know, because you look at the world today. You know, I mean, you know, all the issues with with the police officers and all the military. And all, I mean, all the stuff that's going on. We got, you know, blue lives matter, black lives matter, red lives matter. This matter, that everybody matters. But, but there's that, there's that. We we don't, you know, it's almost like running away from that authority figure. We yeah. want we want to become we want to become who we are, and that's just the way it is. Yeah. You know, what I mean, um, share about about young any anything you share about. Um, well, I see, like, what you said, like, self-confidence, especially in, like, young girls. Like, I've had multiple different girls approach me um, praying for, like, self-esteem issues, um, self-hatred, um, just different, like, suicidal, um, like, being suicidal and just different things like that, like, body image issues. Because the social media, like, it warps, like, the expectations of what um, yeah. girls are supposed to live up, like, girls think they're supposed to live up to. Um with like all the models and all the different things and um they don't see even christian like christians because from my personal testimony i dealt with eating disorders and different things growing up and i grew up in a christian household um but it was just that um that image of just the perfect body the perfect lifestyle the perfect everything i didn't see how much the like the lord created me to be his beautiful masterpiece and i see that a lot in like um, younger, like younger females, even older females, sometimes you just see that um, low self confidence and low self esteem. Amen. All right. I just want to just let everybody out there that you're watching right now, you're watching CTF TV. We have a special program tonight. We have the uh, New Life Drama Company uh, in, and uh, it's a special little evening to talk about the youth. Uh, we're going to have some special things a little bit later on, but. Um, as as we've been as we've been talking about, uh, where where do you where do you see the 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 Facebook, the Instagram, the uh, Twitter, all that stuff um, has become a in a sense it, it ha we know it all has this positive way, sure. but it also has a negative way. What's your what's your aspects on that? I think I think you take it as uh, any other sin. Um, or, or things, you know, Paul says, um, the sin that we so easily besets yeah, us. Um, and I, and one thing I was talking about, my brother and my sister, um, they're both teenagers, and, and we talk quite a bit, and um, God has just done a lot in my family and our lives. And uh, One thing we were talking about is I think they did like a month fast of Instagram and Facebook, and I've done a few, like a week or two a week. And I think I did one, one time for three months, the tour long. Um, but one thing God revealed to me, and this was me personally, I don't, I don't think it's for everyone. Um, but one thing God revealed to me personally was that if I'm taking a fast from it so that I can focus on the Lord more or maybe not um, fall into sin so easily, right. then the purpose for me taking a fast is only to be free for seven days, 30 days. Right. Um, but God wants to deal with the situation in hand. Right. Um, so one thing I, what I've learned is whether I have it or not, uh, he wants me to be able, or he wants me to walk in my identity, mm -hmm. righteous and uh, clean in front of his eyes and pure. And in order to do that, I have to learn to rely on his strength, right. not on my own. Um, and I, I would say, with the social media, it it, it does. Uh, there's an expectation, you know, that a lot of people have to be to be wanted, to be liked, to be cared for. Um, I think it's being transparent in the church mm -hmm. uh, with our youth, being real with them. Um, understanding that they're not the only people that deal with this. They're not the yeah. only person that has this deep desire of getting those likes, getting those. Yeah. Um, and also understanding that God walks with us through the fire. He doesn't um, yeah. he doesn't pick us up and take us past it. He walks right. with us through right. it. Amen. Um, that he's willing. And his spirit is, even though social media isn't something that the Bible dealt with, um, there was many other things like it. Right. And uh, God is God knows exactly what to do with sure. it and how to walk with you through sure. it. He's the answer. Sure. Anyone, anyone else? Oh, I would just say, you know, it's it's a distraction for the most part. If, if nothing else, I mean, we could talk all day about, 
you know, that the sin and things that you can have on, on through the internet, things like that. But I mean, if nothing else, it's, it's a, it's a huge time waster. And I, you know, a lot of talk, we talked to, like I say, a lot of young men who they say, you know, I just want to know, you know what the next step is. I want to know what I should do with my life, you know, because especially as young men, we want, we want purpose. We want, you know, something yeah. to drive us because uh, without that, we don't have anything. We're just going to, we're going to be lazy. We're going to sit around. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that that's the thing that is really the pull to just kind of, uh, to in a sense, honestly, be lazy to not know what hard work is. Um, and so it's a distraction for us. And so what it does is it makes us uh, not seek the Lord, uh, not put him first. Uh, I know even my life, you know, I, I've had to learn to, to find that balance and really um, put that aside and, and begin to you know, open up the word and begin to get in prayer. Uh, because without that, you're not going to know what you're going to do. So if nothing else, it's, it's a huge time waster and it has to be something I think addressed a lot more than it is. Well, you can always go to Google. What, what am I supposed to do the rest of my life? <laughs> <laughs> or YouTube. <laughs> You know, and you think about that, you know, how many times is Google is, you know, we, instead of asking, you know, I, I, I've shared with, I've shared with the congregation many times when I've shared about, you know, we should ask God for everything. You know, if you're going shopping right. for something, ask God. God knows where the deals are. Right. Yeah. Just ask him. Yeah. And he'll, he'll you, you know, if you are that close to him, he will, first of all, he's, he's, <laughs> He's gonna he's gonna sidetrack you, not go there if you don't need it. If it's a yes. if it's a want, not a need. Yes. But the other thing is, the is he, you know, I, I could see testimony upon testimony of how God has opened doors just because you wait on Him, you know, and stuff like that. Where do you see the the media playing a major part? I mean, obviously self esteem issues, but I think a lot of it is uh, laziness and distraction. Like we'd rather have a, I don't think it's everybody, but a lot of people just want it as an easy way out because there's a lot of people that have gotten famous through social media. And so they, I know, at least in my own life, I know I, <laughs> it's too easy. Like when I get a follower, there's a small piece of me that gets excited. Like, ooh, that's one more person that yeah, follows yeah. me and sees what I do. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And it just builds selfishness in us. It does. Um, yeah. And I think, unfortunately, it leads us down a path of wanting more of that instead of wanting more of the Lord. Yeah. I know. Um, I know that with um, different things, we were actually reading this um, book at one point, and it talked about how basically, if you get like, if you get a like or something, you can get like an adrenaline rush. Like mm -hmm. you can feel like you're you're so loved just because you get a like on um, on your Instagram or Facebook or whatever that you get so happy, and it can be very much so like an idol. To where if you stay on it and you like get so addicted to it that you have to you have to have it to feel loved you have to have it to feel purpose that 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 makes it an idol because the Lord like the Lord wants to be the one that makes you feel love and make you um, have um, full purpose in your life. Amen. So. Amen. Um, I know I have so many friends who like what she said they'll talk to me and they'll be like did you see my last post did you see my last post and I'm like why can't you just tell me like. Yeah. Like, because one thing, being in the ministry, like, you don't you don't have a lot of time to just be on your phone right. on social media, which is such a blessing, because yeah. I don't get distracted by that too often. <laughs> um, but when I do have time, I don't want to spend it on my phone just wasting time. Yeah. I want to spend it doing something. I want to, like, talk to my friends. Yeah. So when they're like, hey, did you see that? Did you see it? It's like, can you tell me about it? And so it's really interesting to see really my generation like that, because I... I don't know what well, my parents did, but I'm a little different than them in that way, and I'm very blessed in that. But yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Okay. Well, we're gonna shift a little bit, and then we're gonna uh, we're gonna have another um, uh, skit. But we're before we go that way, uh, we're just gonna just spend just a little bit of time. Um, I just want to share just a real quick uh, how I got saved. A lot of people don't, you know. Uh, when I, I grew up in the church all my life, uh, I was a Lutheran, um, did everything, knew all the Bible stories, knew the whole nine yards, uh, went through, uh, uh, youth, youth and the whole nine yards. I was an older boy, um, got into high school and I just played the part, but did what I wanted. And, um. It wasn't until uh, my wife and I, we were, we were dating, we were still going to church all the time, and um, went to a, we were uh, in Amway, and we went to an Amway convention, 
It was a special convention on the weekend. We were being honored for something, and a friend of mine said, uh, hey, listen, they have a church service on Sunday morning. And he said, you want to go down with me? And I said, not really. You know, I said, I'm, I'm away. I'm, you know, I'm just enjoying it. He said, oh, come on down with me. So we went down, and naturally he sat right in the front row, and uh, the gentleman who was a diamond, very, very uh, up in the Amway uh, uh, Corporation, uh, started. He was preaching hellfire and brimstone, and I got there and I found out that you know what, I'm going to hell. <laughs> that you know, no matter how much I did what I did, that you know, I did never really accepted Christ in my life, and uh, it changed my life. And that was uh, I got saved in an Amway convention. <laughs> so, so anyway, so just share a real quick testimony of how you got saved. I'll go ahead and start. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in a Christian home, actually, uh, my entire life. Um, and so I, I knew all the Bible stories and those kinds of things, obviously. Uh, I actually even watched uh, miracles and things like that happen all around me. Uh, the, the issue was, though, is that I didn't personally know who Jesus was. And so when I was about 18 years old, uh, I actually um, was starting to realize that. I was like, you know, I really don't know who Jesus is. And so I had a buddy of mine over, and we were camping out. And it was, we have uh, 18 acres of woods out back. Uh, and so, so he, he gave me a challenge. He said, I want you to read the Bible for 20 minutes a day for three days. And so I did. And at the end of three days, I said, I didn't want to keep going. I started the book of Proverbs and I started reading. And uh, what was really happening is God's word started getting inside of me. And I, I started to read it and I, uh, for, for myself because my mom always re, you know, would read them growing up. But I never really read the Bible. So reading the Bible really made me realize how much I needed Jesus and, and uh, uh, I didn't know him. And so I went off to college a little bit later, and um, I actually was studying uh, politics and philosophy and those kinds of things. And uh, I actually became, uh, through, through all this study, I actually became agnostic for about six months of my life because uh, I didn't know if, if God existed because I was so brand new to the faith. And so I questioned once again whether or not I was actually Christian. Um, and then through, through all that, basically, through a series of events, the Lord actually called me to be an intern at a camp, a summer camp, um, for that summer. And uh, God basically showed up. Uh, I had a lot of depression. Um, a lot of other things that I deal, dealt with, and the Lord healed me of all of that. Amen. And um, when he did that, you know, I really realized for the first time who Jesus was, and he spoke to me, he told me, I made you a new man. Amen. And so uh, that was really the first time I, I can truly remember um, giving my heart really to Christ for the first time. And about six months later, I joined New Life Drama Company uh, and just been serving here ever since, and I've, I've loved it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, I grew up in a very religious home, very religious. Uh, we weren't Christian. I would, I would say not Christian. Uh, but religious side, seeing God as an angry God, and didn't really know why Jesus died. Um, my dad was very abusive growing up, uh, very physically abusive to me. I have eight younger siblings, and so I was, I'm the oldest boy, so I was always held to a higher responsibility. Uh, worked hard, work, works was very much works drove us. Uh, and then about, four, well, about 13 years old, my family, my dad got saved. Uh, well, my dad got saved when I was 10, and I went through a lot of hurt when I was 12, 13. Um, but then about 14, my family started following the Lord, and, and uh, but me, and I was very, very hurt and very uh, depressed and even suicidal, and I never heard of it growing up, never heard of it, you know, farm life, you know, you always have something to live for, you got to milk the cows, and uh, you got to milk the cows and ride the horses, uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so, you know, I didn't understand what was happening to me, and 16 years old, um, I quit school, and I started working. So I was on construction, um, work, uh, usually I did, I think, 55 hours a week, mm. uh, would work a lot of Saturdays, and then weekends I would start partying and smoking cigarettes, and I would pack a day at 16 and a half, and drinking, and, uh, um, but I always, always tried to clean myself up to come to God, or at least be presentable. I'd go to church with my family and have my little brothers and sisters around my arms and still be hungover or high. Yeah. And I would get so mad at myself, but, you know, I would fall just time and time and time again. And uh, 17 and a half years old, the New Life Drama Company came to my church, and we do this skit that uh, displays Jesus dying on the cross. And I'd heard that story, um, but when they did it, I realized that he did that for me where I am. Uh, not, not after I clean myself up and come where I'm good enough. Amen. And uh, so that changed my life, and the Lord uh, accepted the Lord in my life. And, uh, Three and a half months later, I came to new life and uh, been free from drugs, alcohol, and uh, pornography, and all that for year, for two years now. Amen. Amen. Uh, and God has just done a lot in my life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I also grew up in Christian home. Um, although Christ, Christian is a kind of a malleable term, it seems, these days. Yes. Because um, growing up, I was uh, verbally, mentally, and sexually abused. Um, so I didn't understand what love was. I know I mentioned that before. So growing up, I was very confused, very depressed, very su suicidal. I can remember, like, it was day after day. I think I wrote a su new suicide note every single day trying to figure out what the right words to say were. Um, which, to be honest, it's a blessing from the Lord that I grew up a perfectionist, so I never got it done. Um, <laughs> sorry, dark joke, dark joke. <laughs> uh, point is, um, I don't really remember uh, a defining moment where it was like, oh, I accept the Lord, because I don't ever remember there being a moment where I didn't believe that he was real. Um, it was just a love thing for me. And I, but I do remember when I was 18 years old, I can remember sitting in a room surrounded by people that were actually praying over each other. And I was sitting by myself. Nobody came over to me. I remember hearing a very clear and loud voice in my head say, stop being miserable. You don't have to be miserable. Be happy. I want you to be happy. I remember just being like, oh, you mean I can let it go? That's it? It's, it's done? And literally from that day forward, I had more joy than I can ever remember experiencing. I don't know, I don't know how other than the Lord literally got a hold of me and just spoke to me, and that was it. Yeah. And everything was, I mean, not fine, because obviously life still moves on, but, but I wasn't suicidal anymore. Amen. Amen. Um, kind of similar with Becca is like, well, obviously different, but um, I grew up in a Christian household and kind of just lived off of my parents' faith for a really long time, and I only saw God as um, just a, a scary guy that, you know, I, I deserve hell, I deserve hell, I deserve hell. And so I was afraid of God for a really, really long time. And I always had a spirit of fear around me. I was a really quiet kid growing up. And um, it, it took a while uh, for me to just to realize how much Jesus really loves me. And even now, I still I have no idea. But um, we used to move, we moved around a few times, and we moved churches a lot. So never having a solid church family was really hard and resulted in me just being like, just like continuously just lukewarm. I just didn't really care. Mm -hmm. And um, after we, I was 16, we moved to Indiana and we found this church and um, it's, it's just a family. It's so close, so knit together and such wide age ranges yeah. and diversity. And really going into that church and meeting everyone there and realizing that this is what a church is supposed to be like. It's, it's a family before it's anything else. Touched me so much. Wow. Um, I realized that I hadn't been living like, I hadn't even been living like that with my actual family. Yeah. And um, it kind of just made me like sit back and reevaluate things and see like, this is what God is. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus. They're like literally the three in one. Mm -hmm. So. That was kind of just a really big moment for me, and I actually got baptized there last year. So that was like, whew, really cool. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Um, for me, I also grew up in a Christian household. Um, I dealt with a lot of hurt growing up. Um, I went through um, all types of different abuse and all these just things that led to um, – shame that led to depression anxiety um all across the board and i was trying to i was trying to find things to fulfill me um i always had this like always had this thing in the back of my mind i'm never gonna go to um like drugs and alcohol because i had to keep up that good picture for my family we had to be that perfect christian family and i couldn't be seen doing any of those things so i tried to find fulfillment in um performing so I would do, uh, I did different, like, contemporary Christian music, um, like Lauren Daigle, you know, all of those artists. Um, but I was trying to find fulfillment in um, popularity and the music and just different things like that, that um, on the inside I was really depressed and I was really broken. Um, and then there was this one time I remember going to this women's conference, um, my mom didn't actually tell me we were going to a women's conference, actually. She was just like, you're going to go, we're going to go to Florida, and we're going to go, like, you're going to go sing somewhere. So it ended up being a women's conference. Um, and I remember whenever I was there, um, they made some sort of statement, like, uh, it was almost like a, 
thing where it was flat out, she said, like, I know that there's someone that is so broken that is trying to find fulfillment in something else that um, is not is not fulfilling her. And um, I just remember crying and, like, um, going down and, like, um, getting saved. Because I was saved. I was saved when I was four, but I fully like committed my life to Christ, even though after, after I left that, um, thing, I probably didn't actually get set free of a lot of things for about another year and a half. Um, cause I was dealing with like eating disorders, just all of those types of things. And it was like, there was like, that was the place and the time when I figured out I needed to go into some sort of ministry. Like the Lord was calling me into some sort of ministry. And then Figured out about this ministry, and now I'm here. And uh-huh. the Lord is, <laughs> the Lord is good, and has saved me from a lot. So, well, I'm thankful that the Lord has put this all together. I, I was very, very familiar. You familiar with the Master's Commission? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that was um, something that I was, a friend of mine was involved with, and, and so I kind of, when I first heard about this, I said, "Wow, that's just like Master's Commission," uh-huh. you know, kind of in a way. But um, so. What we're going to do right now is uh, we're going to uh, take a little quick break, and they're going to come out, and uh, they're going to do another skit, and then we're going to uh, close out tonight. But um, I want you just to sit and watch and let their opportunity to minister to you minister to you right where you are. You've heard a lot of stories tonight. You've heard a lot of things. Uh, Continue to pray for your children. Continue to pray for those that are that are uh, out there in the world that um, that desperately need. Our youth need to get saved. Our youth need to not just get saved, but they need a relationship with Jesus. Um, because uh, just being saved, we can all, as you can see, we all said, hey, we all came from a Christian background, but we we had the, never got a complete res, a complete relationship with Jesus. <laughs> It starts out funny and ends with a more serious skit. What the the hell? Becca? Melvin? How are you? I think I'm good. It's been so long. You look good. You look really good. Man, where are we? I don't know. Okay, okay. The last thing I remember. Okay. I was driving my car. It was raining really heavy. I, I swerved and I saw a bright light. Wait, wait. You saw a bright light? The last thing I remember is I was running through a field being chased by a cow. And I saw a bright light. We're You're dead! dead. Oh, oh, no. Great. Now my tombstone's going to say, Death by Cow. Oh, that's, that's fun. Your family wouldn't do that to you. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. They'd say something way more funnier, like, how is lactose intolerant? <laughs> really? <laughs> you think it's funny? It's not even funny, all right? It's not <laughs> it's funny. It's a little funny. <laughs> but that's okay. I get it. I mean, you're dead. It's all just a moot point. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> yeah, I'll stop milking it. <laughs> That last one was an utter disaster. All right, all right. I get it, I get it, I get it. Hey, remember this room right here? Uh, remember that one class we took with uh, Professor, Professor Wright? Wright. Huh. Oh, Turns yeah. out Professor Wright wasn't wrong. <laughs> anyway, he described this judgment room down to a T. Yeah, he did. He said there'd be two lines of Christians, yeah. the sheep and the goats, yeah, yeah. and how one line, the sheep, would get into heaven, yeah, and the that. other line, the goats, yeah. would not get into heaven. Yeah. And the only thing separating them was a line. Just like that one. Goes right down, down the, the middle. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. no. <laughs> what does this mean? I mean, can we, can we move the line? Is it flexible? I mean, You're I mean, acting like I've been here before. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe you didn't know. Maybe you okay, were paying attention. Let's look at the facts. Two lines of Christians. Right, yep. One line gets into heaven. One line doesn't get into heaven. The sheep, yeah, the, the goats. Sheep the goats get into heaven. Well, cows don't chase goats. They don't chase sheep either. All right, all right. Well, let's look at the lines. You're right. Let's look at our lines, shall we? Let's look at your line first. Right. Uh, there. You see that guy up there? Six foot beard, covered in tattoos. He is obviously a goat. All right. Let's, let's look, look at, at my line. line then. 
Uh, there, all the way up at the front, you see that little old lady? Oh, yeah. I guarantee she is so sweet she's never sinned a day in her life. No, I don't want a Tootsie Roll. Ma'am, why would I want a Tootsie Roll? You're obviously the goat. No, I'm not! Well, what makes me the goat? Well, you're a dude, and a dude is more likely to grow a beard, so you're the goat! Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't even grow a beard. I couldn't even grow a beard if I wanted to. I'm 20 years old and I can't even grow a beard. My dad can't even grow a beard. Okay, someone's a little salty. Wait, 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 what am I? The goat. Wait, say it one more time. One more You're time. the goat. One more time. Hey, attention everyone that is here. This is your G-O-A-T goat. Exactly, because the scripture says that the goats don't know that they're goats. So oh, I'm the goat. No, no, you misunderstand. This whole time I've been saying I'm the goat. No, no, no. No, no, no I am so the goat. No, no, you're, I'm the one you're that missing. Said it. I'm, no, the no, goat, I'm the goat, obviously. I'm the goat. Bah! See, that's a that's great goat noise. That sounds like a sheep to me. Oh, I am the goat. Me. 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 God. Wow. Hey, are these really? But where are you going? Hey, come back. Hey. Uh, we're in the same line. I'm on his right yes. side. Oh, wait a second. He's moving again. He was just getting a cup of coffee. Andre is gone. Wait a second. I'm on his left side. Am I really the goat? Becca, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, Hey, you were in ministry longer than I was. I know. I, I was there any time the church doors were open. I, I set up and tore down for every event. Becca, we got to see so many people get saved. I got so many people saved. It doesn't make sense. I, I let people into my home. They stole from me. I forgave them. I gave so much up for ministry. Wait, Becca, Becca, I don't think it's about how much you gave up for ministry. Here's a question. Why are you the sheep? You quit ministry. Becca, I didn't quit. The only time that it looked like I had my life together was when I was on stage preaching. I took a break to get back to God. Well, you know who didn't take a break? The homeless. And when you quit, I had to pick up for your slack. And then you had the audacity to ask me to quit. Not to quit. To take a break. We were in the same boat. There's nothing wrong with ministry. Exactly. There is nothing wrong with ministry. But when your love for ministry outweighs your love for God, that's where there's a problem. Well, somebody had to do it. And when you quit, I did it. And when my family hated me because I stopped spending time with them, I still did it. Who cares about the end of the day? It wasn't for Christ. I built the kingdom. Whose kingdom? Mine! God? What do you mean you never knew me? I even have a tear in my eye. And I've been shaved for 30 some years. Maybe tonight, of all the things that we talked about, we talked about the young people here tonight, that the things that they've gone through, maybe you're in the same situation. You know, I had problems. I, again, grew up in a, in a, in a, uh, a Christian home but never got saved till I was almost uh, 20, 23, 24 years old. Because I didn't know Jesus. I thought I could do it on my own. And even in ministry, as I've been in full-time ministry for 27 years, there are times that as I first started, I would put so much time into making sure I was there at church, making sure I was doing this, making sure this, making sure that not worrying about my family, about my kids, because I had to work for God. And then God got my attention. And he said to you, he said, what are you doing? Who's your first priority? And I realized that my first priority was him. My second priority was my wife. My third priority was my kids. And then the church became my fourth priority. And all of a sudden, my life started to change in a whole different way. Maybe today you're trying to play church. Maybe you're trying, trying to play Christian. But I want to tell you right now, there's no better love than the love that God has for you. That he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, to take the pain, to take the sorrow, to take everything that was needed so that you and I could get saved 
And what I'm talking about is being saved is having that relationship back with the Father. That's what Jesus came for. He came so that we would be able to be reconciled back to the Father, the one who created you, the one who knows you by name, the one that knows all the hairs on your head or the hairs that aren't on your head. He knows everything about you. So tonight, as we have seen the, the New Life Drama Company come and share their testimony, come and share their lives and how God has changed their lives, and continue, maybe tonight is a night that you need to change your life. Maybe tonight is a night for you to say, you know what, I have been fighting it and fighting it and fighting it. I know I, it's not about religion, it's not about church, it's about relationship. We come to know Jesus Christ, not only as your Savior, but then also as your Lord. So tonight, if you are looking to be able to accept Christ Jesus, all you need to do, the Bible says, is all you have to do is ask Him. All you have to do is come to Him. It's very simple. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer because I want you to do it where you are today and to realize that you can't save yourself. Your pastor can't save you. Your mother can't save you. Your children can't save you. The religious guy down the street can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. And when you draw nigh to him, he will draw nigh to you. And not only will he draw nigh to you, but he will embrace you and he will continue to protect you, guide you, provide for you in everything you need. But I'm also going to share this with you, that when you become a born again believer, when you accept Jesus in your heart, you say, okay, it's all over with. No, that's just the start. And then God will start to refine you. I'll be 63 in a week and God's still refining me. He's still finding things in my life that I know I need to change and I have to relinquish. And that's all we're asking you tonight is just to relinquish your life and give it to Jesus. I'm telling you right now, it will be the greatest, the greatest, the greatest decision you ever make in your life. And that is to say, Jesus Christ, I need you into my life as Lord and Savior. And you can do that tonight. Remember, that God loves you more than anything. And we love you because we're here for one purpose, and that's to share the good news, that Jesus came for the world to be able to reconcile back to the Father. So tonight, before you put your head down on your pillow, or even as you're watching this right now, you just close your eyes, and in your own prayer and in your own time, you ask God to come into your life and watch him do something that's absolutely amazing. So, where do you guys go from here? To uh, Middle, Middleville, New York. Middleville, New York. Middleville, New York. All right. The service tomorrow night at 7 p.m. 7 p.m. on Sunday. Okay. Well, what I want you to do is I want you, we're all going to stretch our hands forward to the and I want you to pray as you all, however the Lord leads you, is to pray for what's on your heart for those that are out there, whether it's youth, whether it's girls or guys or whatever. And uh, just uh, take your time and just, just, just share. Father, I thank you for love and kindness and peace. Father, right now I pray for anyone who's going through a time in their life where they feel like this is literally the end, like they can't go any further. Help them to know that, yeah, they can't, but with you, you can help them, Father. You can carry them through. Father, help them to be able to lean on you. If they've been leaning on you their whole life, if they haven't been, Father, just help them to realize at this moment they can give it all entirely to you nothing back. Leave it all on the altar for you, Father. Lord God, I want to ask you right now that you would speak to the youth, those in our generation, Lord, right now, 
who are questioning whether or not you are, first and foremost, whether or not even real, and whether or not you are good. And who question that because they, they see circumstances in their life that they don't understand. And they don't understand um, why a good God would have this happen. Lord, I pray that you would just, um, in, in, their own, in your own way, answer their questions in their heart, Father. Give them peace. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would show them, God, how real you really are. Your love for them. Jesus, show yourself to, the, to our generation. Wake us up, God. Speak to them. God, show them how much you truly, truly love them, what you've done for them on the cross, God. I pray even tonight, God, that they would have just divine encounters, revelations, even dreams about you tonight, Jesus. That they would wake up with, with such an intense desire and longing to seek you, God, to put away social media, God, to put away all the lies, all the distractions, Lord, that, that harm them, God. Lord, I speak specifically against self-harm that's on our generation and the depression, Lord. Um, Lord, the, the cutting and the suicide, Lord, we speak against that. Lord, I pray if anyone right now is dealing with that, that's even watching right now, that right now their scars are beginning to heal, Lord, that you would just begin to speak to them and show them that this is not your will or your desire for their life. I pray we get a hold of young men to show them, God, how to be leaders. God, that you want, uh, you don't want them to deal, uh, God, with, with lust in their lives, but you want them to be um, young men and warriors for you, Jesus, that you don't want them to live with complacency, God. God, speak to their hearts right now, I pray. Holy Spirit, fill their room wherever they're at. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, I just want to thank you so much right now for peace. God, peace over every situation that we have, uh, not just in this room, but in the people that are watching and in the rooms that they're in for peace, God. Peace within the storm that, Lord, while everything around them is going to chaos, that, God, they can sit and they can rest in your presence and say, I know it's going to be okay because I am with the Lord. I also want to thank you, God, for a whole, though. I want to thank you for an emptiness in each person's life that cannot be filled except for you, Jesus. Yes. That it would draw them to you more than ever before. That, Lord, when they try to run, that hole gets bigger and they have to come back to you. Yes. That, God, they're going to continue to seek and seek and seek. And until they know that they've come to you, that hole will not be filled in Jesus' name, because you are the only one that can help us, the only one that can save us, the only one that can change us. Nothing grows apart from what you make grow, Lord. So I thank you that that hole grows bigger right now so that their relationship with you can go, grow stronger. In Jesus' name. Papa, I thank you for giving hope to the hopeless. And I just pray right now for... Um, strength in everyone's life that they would just be able to come to know you that they would be able to know that you love them more than any any person could you came and you sent your son to die for them and I just thank you for that and I just pray that they would be able to come and realize how much you truly do love them and how much you want their identity to be based off of you instead of off of things of this world that you want them to just have you and be so on fire for you that they would just love you with all of their hearts and that you would just be I just pray for sh just joy and just peace and everything in their mind Papa just pray for this um, depression this anxiety all these things that overwhelm these people everything that goes on in their mind that you would just give them peace and joy right now Papa they would just be able to have they would just be able to walk in these things and that you would just be able to be the one to fill their hearts and that they would just be so overwhelmed by you right now Thank you for the day that you've done. Well, I pray for those that feel like uh, giving up or have given up, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, you would prove yourself uh, once again, Lord, the first love. Lord Jesus, and those that know you, Lord, that have strung out and stressed thin, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name, Lord God, if there's any bones in their bodies or any sicknesses, Lord, that be healing right now in Jesus' name. Lord. Yes. They would see a miracle right in their own home, and they would realize it's not about someone praying over me physically, but it's simply the move of God and the Holy Spirit healing them. So, Lord Jesus, I pray you would prove yourself to them in that way. And Lord God, I pray for those who feel like they've gone too far or too messed up for you, Lord. In your word, it says, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So, Lord, we thank you for that promise. We thank you, Lord, no matter what, no matter what we've done accept us as we are, Lord, but you don't keep us there, you change us, you mold us into this new man, this new creature, creature, Lord, in your image. So 
the Holy Spirit, we pray you would minister to each one exactly like you know how, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for each person that's here, Lord, each person that's listening, God, the value that they have in their life, and Lord, while they were, uh, Lord God, you knitted them together in their mother's womb, Lord, you know exactly how many hairs are on their head. You love each one of them dear. Pray over them, God. Pray you bless them and reveal yourself to them. Pray for a hunger for the word of God also, Lord. Well, I thank you for watching. It's a special uh, night tonight here uh, on CTF TV. And uh, you can always go to www.ctf-tv.com. If you have a request or if you want to share a story that's happened tonight, you can go to CT CTF TV live at gmail.com. My name is Eric Zyler. I pastor the church uh, at the River Church here in Pensacola and Coins Point. And I just want to thank all of you for coming to bless my life tonight. And I know that you've blessed everybody there. Thank so you. we want to thank you for that. And uh, God bless you. And we'll talk to you soon.